Please be seated. And uh, receive with me uh, our speaker this morning. Uh, Lori uh, Pollich Short is a speaker, an author, an associate pastor at Ocean Hills Covenant Church. Uh, she speaks all over the place. I mean, like 500,000 people in the last 20 years. So she must have started when she was five. No, <laughs> that's a joke between Lori and me. Lori's a graduate of Fuller Seminary. She's written a lot of books. You can look at some of them out there. Uh, Lori, we're, we're, first of all, we're just really blessed to have you in town, uh, not to mention in chapel. So we welcome you in the name of Christ. Come on up. Hills. <laughs> it's so great to be here. And you know what? You guys don't even know how great this man is here that is in his last year, I know, as campus pastor, but has not only served this campus, but literally all over this country as a great servant of Christ. So let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Ben. In Santa Barbara 12 years and when I first got here I was single and the pastor that I work with John Ireland asked me to preach on contentment and because I was still getting to know the church I decided to begin by giving a little sound bite out of my life so I said I got up this morning and I was all alone no husband no kids there's a for sale sign out in the front, so I don't even know if I'm going to be able to stay in my place much longer. And if I can be honest, dating at my age is a little bit of a bummer. Because everybody has baggage. It's just a matter of choosing what kind of luggage you can deal with. And, you know, working at a church can be a little bit painful because you see couples and families everywhere you look and you feel your singleness everywhere you go and I just stopped and everybody was staring at me like you're staring at me right now and I looked over at the pastor and I could tell he was thinking I hope you kept your resume going and then I didn't say anything I just started again I said I got up this morning and I had the place to myself it was quiet, and I could do whatever I wanted. The for sale sign is still there, so I know I get to stay here another month. And if it sells, maybe I'll find something even better. And you know, dating at my age is so much easier, because you really know yourself more. And you also have a lot more grace for people, because you recognize that life is complicated. And my job working at a church is such a gift. What a blessing to have a family where you work when there isn't one at home. Now you guys, I gotta tell you, I should have stopped my sermon right there because it was the only part of the talk that people actually remembered. And the truth is, it's been a lot of life since then and there are still people who remember it. And I believe that morning was the morning that the seed was planted for the new book that I just wrote that came out because I recognized how important our perspective is for our life and for our faith. And the truth is, this isn't just a psychology thing. This is actually a biblical thing. We find perspective throughout the Bible. We see it especially in Paul, who wrote the whole uh, book of Philippians when he was in prison. They were actually letters to believers. And he wrote the verse that I was preaching on, on contentment, while he was in jail. And while he was sitting in jail, he said, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has actually happened to me has only served to advance the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking about Paul in prison, and there's probably one guy there that looks like Attila the Hun guarding his jail cell. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really think so, Paul. How is this advancing the gospel? But Paul knew that because he was there, other people were preaching on his behalf. What Paul didn't know is that he thought to himself, what can I do with the circumstances that God has given me? I know. I 
can write letters. I'll write letters to encourage the believers. What Paul could not have known is that today those letters make up half the New Testament and have impacted thousands if not millions of Christians all over the globe. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Paul had the God's eye view of his life and he knew that if God had put him in jail, there must have been a purpose for that. But I gotta be honest, I don't always have that perspective on my life. I don't know about you guys. I know it's Monday, some of you had a fabulous weekend, you're still riding high on your weekend. Others of you, not so much. And you might be sitting there going, it's kind of a bummer. The guy I have a crush on doesn't even know I'm alive. The girl I'm eyeing right now, she doesn't even know I'm here. Or maybe you even just ended a relationship. Or maybe you're dealing with a crisis in your life. We don't always have the God's eye view of our circumstances. So how do we get it? In my book, I offer four lenses, and they're not actual glasses that you can put on, but they're actual lenses that I maintain. If we use all four of them, we can actually see more of what God sees about our life and have that God's eye view, that perspective on our life. And so I start with the big view. The big view is when you pull back on your life. You pull back like you're looking in a microscope and all of a sudden you look back and see the bigger picture of your life. The fact is you are touching other people all the time. You are impacting the people around you. Your story is so much bigger than you. I think we see this especially in the book of Esther. Now some of you know, maybe some of you saw Wonder Woman this summer. Esther is actually the original Wonder Woman. I'm not kidding. You got to read this book. She is a Jewish orphan who was raised by her cousin Mordecai. And she happened to be very, very beautiful. So she got swept up in this contest because the king had decided that he was going to get rid of his queen and he wanted to call all the beautiful maidens all over the land and they were going to come to the palace, undergo six months of beauty treatments and then be paraded before the king and he would pick a new queen. It was actually the first recorded version of The Bachelor. Some of you don't know that. <laughs> So the king had all of these beautiful maidens parade in front of him and Esther got the rose. She won. <laughs> she won. And so most movies just end right there, right? I mean, that's a great story. Esther becomes queen. But you know what? That was only the beginning of Esther's story. And some of you have read the book. You know that. Because when she got in the palace, she became aware that there was a plot thickening an evil man named Haman who had the king's ear and he didn't like that the Jews didn't bow to the king and so he started feeding the king with all this hey we should get rid of these people because they're not bowing to you they only bow to God and the king really had very little personality if you want to be honest and so he kind of listened to this guy and said okay well maybe so and so Esther finds out that her cousin Mordecai is out of the city gate and he's fasting and praying sackcloth and ashes and she's like, what is going on? So she goes down there to see this man who's like her father and he says to her, Esther, Esther, you are in that palace for just this time because you are the only one that can do anything about this. And then he says, you know what, if you don't speak up, relief for the Jews will come from somewhere else. And then the most famous line in Esther, in chapter 4, he says this, but who knows that you are here for such a time as this. All of a sudden, Esther pulls back and she sees her life the way God sees her life. That she is positioned there for just this purpose. That she was made beautiful for just this purpose. That she was swept into the bachelor contest for just this purpose. That was why she was there. Esther got the big view of her life. And I wonder, do we have the big view of our life? Do we see our life as bigger than just us? Do you realize that you are here on this earth for a purpose, 
that God has you here, even at Westmont College, for a purpose. That you, your life, is more important than you think. I'm not going to tell you what happens in the book. You've got to read it. But the second thing we recognize with the big view is that the scene you are in is part of a bigger story. I have a story that I tell in this book, but I actually got it from a mutual friend of Ben and mine, Mike Iaconelli, who's no longer with us. He's parting with Jesus now. But he shared this story with me, and I think it illustrates this so well. It comes out of World War II. And towards the end of World War II, we didn't have the technology then that we do now. And so uh, Great Britain was bombing Germany. And the way that they would do that, until, until Germany surrendered, they would go every day, they would take off with their uh, bomber plane, and they would fly to German airspace, drop the bomb, and come back. And they were always surrounded by their protective planes. Well, one day they got all the way over there, and they dropped the bomb, and they were coming back to Great Britain, but they were still in German airspace and they looked and they saw that they had lost their protective planes. And then they saw some German fighter planes coming closer and closer and closer until they were within shooting range. Well, they braced themselves for what they knew was going to happen and five bullets slammed into the plane, right into the direction of the gas tank. And so they literally, the pilot closed his eyes and braced himself for the explosion. But it never happened. So they looked and they saw that gas was seeping out of the gas tank, but there was no explosion. Well, there was no explanation. They quickly regained control, flew down to Great Britain. They all got off the plane and a mechanic came on board. And he took those bullets and he was able to dislodge them. And do you know that he found that four out of the five bullets were empty, no gunpowder inside? And in the fifth bullet, there was a small, crumpled up piece of paper. And I want to read you what that piece of paper said. We are Polish POWs, forced to make bullets in factory. When guards do not look, we do not fill with powder. It's not much, but it's the best we can do. You think about the fact that those POWs had the wherewithal where they were to not say, my life is a waste. There is nothing I could do. No, like Paul, they said, what can we do? You are only in a chapter of a much bigger story. And God has plans for you here at Westmont. And he is touching people through your life that you know and people that you don't know because your impact is touching others and they will go on to touch others. Your life is bigger than you think. That's the big view. But the second lens is the present view because this is where we live. We live our current chapters and we know that God is in the present. Now some of you are not in the present right now. Mentally, you're thinking about what just happened. Maybe you saw that cute guy or that cute gal that you have your eyes on. Maybe you've got your eyes on him right now. But you're thinking maybe about something that happened before chapel. Some of you are already thinking about after chapel, when you can go from here, or when you can eat lunch, or when something's going to happen, or you've got a test. Mentally, we are so often in the past or the future, but God is always in the now. He's outside of time. He's always in the now. And in Exodus 3, you can actually read that at one point when God is speaking to Moses, it sounds like he's speaking in the wrong tense. Because Moses is scared because God is saying, I want you to go to Pharaoh. You're going to let my people go. You're going to gather them up. You're going to take them in. He's like, who should I say sent me? And God says, tell them I am sent you. I am sent you. I am Moses. I am always in the present. And if you're mentally in the past or the future, you are there without him because he's always in the now. Now some of you are going, you know what, Lori? I don't really feel like being in the now right now. The now is not so good. I'm living a scene that I would prefer to take a pass on. We've all been there. I can tell you, I was in one of those scenes before I got to Santa Barbara. 
What happened to me was I was single a lot longer than I wanted. I wasn't the ring by spring gal, but I thought about 25 is when I was going to meet my guy. Well, 25 came and went, and 30, I started praying a little louder, and by 40, I began to suspect that God was deaf, because it still hadn't happened to me. Well, finally, at 42, I got engaged, and the hallelujah chorus broke out. I probably had my two bridal showers, and I got my wedding dress, and then just a couple months short of my wedding, my fiancé got deployed. And we contemplated the shotgun wedding, but decided against it. I thought, I've waited this long, I can wait nine more months. But in the course of his deployment, unbeknownst to me, his ex-wife began to have second thoughts about their divorce. And so when he came back, now I've been engaged a year and a half, we broke up, and he remarried his ex-wife, which is actually a great story when you're not the girl engaged to the guy. <laughs> can remember Christians would say to me well isn't it great that God used you to bring them back together <laughs> it is awesome <laughs> and I hope you have the same opportunity someday <laughs> but the truth was honestly the truth was is that it was a great story it was a great story. When I was your age, my parents decided that they were going to get a divorce. And they never did get back together. But I would have loved nothing more than if that had happened. Divorce is a hard and painful thing. So it was a great story, just not for me. It was a faith crisis for me. But I learned that God is always in the present. And even when you're in a scene that you would never choose, God has things for you in that chapter. We may not like it, but my faith took a leap in that time. Because I was speaking all over the place. As Ben said, I was speaking, encouraging students and youth workers. And I can remember saying to God, I can't tell people what happened to me. They're going to walk away from you. And I distinctly heard, in the quietness of my heart, the Spirit of God say to me, don't you worry about me, little girl. You just tell your story, and you watch. And so I developed what I call the middle of the story theology. And I would tell my story. And everybody was horrified at the end. But at the end, I would say, but you know what? I got up this morning, and I'm still breathing. So my story isn't through. And I don't know what God's going to do. And I don't know if I'll ever get married. But I know I have a good God. And I know he isn't through. And I want to tell you something. I think we wait too long to give our testimonies. We wait until the bow is tied and then we have the great story. But there was never a time that my testimony was more powerful than when I was in the middle of the story. Because I said, I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm holding on to him because he is faithful, because he is good. That is a testimony. Because let me tell you something. Nobody really cares when everything's going great in your life. <laughs> but when things aren't going great in your life and you're still holding on to God, that is a witness. That is a testimony. So middle of the story, that's where I was. But the God of the present tense showed me that he was with me. And about four months later, I was sitting in my apartment and an old friend of mine by the name of John Ireland called me. And he said, Lori Polich, I heard you got married. I'm like, nope. <laughs> he goes, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, but that's not why I'm calling. I'm calling because we were praying about this new position at our church that I've planted. And your name came up. Well, I wasn't looking for a job. But I was looking for a life. And I thought, I need to go up there and check this out. The timing is too weird. And so I came up here, fell absolutely in love with this church. I want to say something about the present tense. You may be focused on a door that you would like to see open. For me, it was marriage. But what we miss when we're focused on that door are the doors that are opening around us. 
And do you know something? Sometimes one door opens to another door, which leads to another door, which may actually lead to the door you're looking for. It's just a different route. That's why it's so important that you pay attention to the present tense God. Because I was packing my bags. I had decided to come. And I remember I went jogging on this path. And I saw this guy that I would always pass with his dog. And I, I said, oh, guess what? I'm moving to Santa Barbara. And he goes, oh, no. And I said, what do you mean, oh, no? It's beautiful there. He goes, oh, no. You're never going to meet anybody up there. Santa Barbara is the home of the newly wed and nearly dead. There are no single people in Santa Barbara. And I'm like, of course is sending me to Santa Barbara, of course. But we have a big God. Because three years later, at the ripe young age of 49 years old, I got married to a wonderful man. And because I'd waited so long, God thought, you know what, I'll throw in two for the price of one. So I actually got a son in the mix, because I pretty much biologically aged myself out of parenting. And we've raised him. He was six when we married, and he's 14 today, and loves it when I talk about him. So <laughs> the point is, the present tense is where we live. Don't miss what God is doing now. The third lens is the rear view. Why do we want to look back? Because sometimes we need to look back to have courage and faith to move forward. I wonder how many of you record your God stories. I hope you do. All throughout scripture, the Israelites would build stone altars every time God did something. And you know why they do that? Because they walked everywhere. And every time you'd walk by a pile of stones, you knew God had been there. You knew. You remembered all the great things that God had done. That was your story of faith. When the Israelites passed through the Red Sea and they were singing about it and they were talking about it and then months later they forgot about it. And it was when they forgot their stories that they lost their way. We have to look back. Now some of you have some painful things in your past. The thing that I've noticed about the rear view is that a lot of our stories get reinterpreted with time. Maybe something that happened that was painful has given you something that you needed. And you see that now. I can remember I was speaking out in New Jersey. And it was when I was still single. And I was speaking to a bunch of youth workers. And they all went to lunch. And that was my one time not to talk. And this one lady stayed behind. And she approached me. And she said, you know, I wanted to go to lunch. But the Lord wouldn't let me. So now she had my attention. And she walked up to me. Now I was talking about youth ministry and she took my hand and she said these words, the Lord is going to bring you a husband. Now let me just pause here to say at the time I was working at the Presbyterian Church and I have to tell you we did not have prophecies in the Presbyterian Church. We had meetings about prophecies. <laughs> this was not part of my faith experience. And she took my hand, she said, the Lord is going to bring you a husband, and he will love you as Christ loves the church. And he will take your head to his chest, and he will protect you, and he will be a support to your ministry. Well, I was crying by the end. She named the desire of my heart, and four months later, I met the man who was first my fiancé. And then, a few months later, we got engaged. A year and a half later, when we broke up, I wanted to call the lady from New Jersey. There's a few things you left out from your prophecy. But here's the thing, you guys. The prophecy actually did come true. But it was only after it didn't come true. And all the stuff in between was the most important stuff of all with my faith. Because it's in the confusion and in the darkness and in the times when you don't know what God's going to do that your faith muscle is stretched. And that is what God is about in your life. The rear view gives you the courage to go forward. And then the last lens that I want to talk about, the most important of all, the higher view. The higher view is when you say, Lord, my life is not my own. Everything that you've allowed into my life, every gift you've given me is yours. My life is yours. Now there's a lot about your life you didn't get to choose. 
You didn't get to choose when you were born. You didn't get to choose the parents you were born to. You didn't get to choose the color of your skin. You didn't get to choose the place in the world that you were born. But every single day, you have made choices of how you are going to live your God-given life. Now, we live in the age of comparison. I know that everybody on Facebook and Instagram is more attractive than they really are. Because we don't ever post the real stuff. And so sometimes we want to trade our life. I don't want my life. I want that life. We don't get that choice. But you get to choose what you're going to do with the one God-given life you have. And I want to introduce you to someone that you've probably seen on State Street at one time or another, if you've been here long enough. His name is Chris Benedict. Chris goes to Ocean Hills Church, and he's a great friend of all of ours. And Chris has cerebral palsy. And Chris has decided to take his one and only life that God has given him and live it to God's glory. And I don't want to steal his fire, so I'm going to let Chris tell his own story now. So let's watch. I have cerebral palsy. My app drive score was zero. That means I was suddenly dead when I was born. I weighed three pounds, one ounce. And my mom had a cranial aneurysm and, you, and she died from that. And then my dad took me home. He couldn't take care of me for obvious reasons and sent me down to live with my grandparents. I lived with them for about 20 years until I moved out. My aunt came into church for the first, for the first time. We were, when, when I thought of church, I thought of choir music. And, and you know, when I got there, it was a small rock band. And I was like, yeah, I can deal with this. So one thing led to another. I met Christ, and it changed my life. God has given me new eyes even though I have a disability. And what I'm able to do with my abilities. Because in the opportunities God has laid out in front of me, I've been able to DJ. I've been able to do public speaking. I, I just landed a job at a new science museum. I've done several half marathons, one for the school for people with disabilities in, in Nicaragua. Jesus says, in their weakness, they are made strong. If I encounter a step that I can't go over, do I get frustrated? You bet that. If I didn't have help, I couldn't do what I do. It's because of God's blessing that I'm able to do that. Jesus said that all these things on earth are just temporary. And things that are, that are unseen are eternal. And he said, when we die, we don't die, we just change form. That's what I'm really looking forward to. What I can't do now, I will be able to do it then and forever.
Chris was going to make it here today, but he's sorry. He had to work at the Science Museum. Chris has a perfect mind. It just doesn't come out of his mouth the way it's formulating in it. So when you see him next, I want you to go up to him and give him a big hug and thank him for ministering to you today. Chris was the DJ at my wedding. He's an amazing person. But no more amazing than any one of us who has made a decision to take our God-given life and live it to the glory of God. The good, the hard, the wonderful, the terrible. To say this life is only this much of the story. And one day we're all going to be with Jesus in eternity. And so can we say, can we say like Chris, I am willing, I'm willing to live this life you've given me, Lord. I hope so. And I hope that these lenses today will help. Let's pray. Would you just take a moment, and if you would like to join me in a prayer, I want to invite you to place your hands in your lap, palms up. And we do this as opposed to say, Lord, I'm open. I am willing. I need help. I complain. I've seen that video now and I don't even know what I'm complaining about. But God, we all have hard things. And if we're honest, some of us this morning really have fists in our lap because we're upset. Things aren't happening the way we wish they were happening. But Lord, we just, we open our hands because we say there is a purpose for our life. You brought us here for a reason. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here at Westmont that they would open their eyes, that they would live their God-given life to your glory, however many days they have, knowing that it is just a minute in light of eternity. And so, God, we're yours. Use us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for having me.